Good morning. Welcome to worship at the Trinitarian Congregational Parish of Castine, both those of you who are present in the sanctuary as well as those of you who are joining us virtually. One note, it's pretty warm here, and so for those of us who are backbenchers, feel free to move closer to the purview of the fan up there if it really gets, really gets bad. I want to raise the flag of thanks for the manifold efforts of this congregation, those who rose back up immediately after the work of lobster rolls to serve French toast to, in many forms, plus fruit and beverage to all who presented themselves. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It means a lot. You should know that the donations and the purchases that come from both the lobster roll sales and the donations from the French toast breakfast go to support this church's ministries of food and housing. I need to announce the annual meeting, which will take place in two weeks, immediately following this service. All are welcome. On matters that require a vote, members will vote. Uh, we're going to receive the reports of officers and committees, and there are three votes that will take place. One is the, 20, the suggested 20, 2025 budget. There's a bylaw change, a really big one. The bylaws currently say that the annual meeting has to happen in August, and every now and then we go back and forth, and so this bylaw change would give the council the prerogative to change it for either July or August. Um, the, there will be a slate of officers, and all this material will be circulated well in advance of the meeting. We gather mindful of the passing of Andy's dad, they had the memorial service on Friday, uh, communicated with her since then, and she said it was glorious. Uh, she said it was a great tribute to her dad, and she will return midweek, and in the meantime, if you have any needs, I hope you won't hesitate to contact me or any one of the deacons. Once again, we're grateful to Marion for sharing her great talent with us in this worship. You, may, you enrich our worship, and we thank you for that. Are there other announcements? Are there other announcements? This is the day that the Lord has made. Oh, did I miss one? Yes. Real quick, I'd just like to welcome Sloan, Catherine, and Will to the church today. They're all part of Heather's family. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, Terry. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of God. rise, if able, for the call to worship. Good morning. Our soul waits for the Lord, who is our help and shield. Our prayer of invocation. Loving God, your word brings peace to all who turn to you. Send your Holy Spirit to dwell among us that we might praise Christ's glory. Amen. The opening hymn this morning in the New Century Hymnal is All Glory, Laud, and Honor 
number 216. Please be seated. Even in our faithlessness, God loves us still and waits in mercy to forgive. Trusting in the promises made through Christ, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Holy God, you promise us a life full of blessing, but we do not always believe. You incite us to hope, but we fall back into fear. You urge us to give freely, but we cling to what we have. You call us to watch at all times for you, but we grow lazy and self-absorbed. Forgive us, increase our hope, enlarge our hearts, and keep us alert to the wonders you work in the world every day. For the sake of Jesus, Amen. Hear these words from our God. I cannot give up on you. My compassion grows warm and tender. When my children come trembling, I will bring them home. Believe the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Please be seated. Today's passage from Amos combines a prophetic vision with some of the only biographical information scripture gives us about him. The declaration of this vision provokes a response in which Amos must assert his authority to speak for God. 
To this point, his prophecies have taken the form of the pronouncement of divine judgment. As chapter 7 begins, the form shifts to prophetic visions. This passage includes the third of four such visions in the book of Amos. The first two visions, a swarm of locusts and fire from heaven, reveal scenes of impending disaster and are followed by Amos' plea for divine mercy and it results in God's promise to relent. One footnote, most contemporary biblical scholars agree that the word plumb line is an inaccurate translation for reasons too many to enumerate just now. Hear these words from Amos. A reading from the book of Amos, chapter 7, verses 7 to 15. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. And then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And then the priest Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is a temple of the kingdom. And then Amos answered the priest Amaziah, I am no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. One of the great benefits of the book of Psalms is that it allows us to explore, meditate, reconsider, and perhaps see that relationship with God in new, challenging, and hope-giving ways. Psalm 85 is just such an example. The psalm itself is composed of three distinctive movements. A remembrance of God's favor in the past, a plea about present trials, and the part that we shall read responsibly, reassuring words about God's present presence and imminent salvation. Let me hear what the God, what God the Lord will speak. To those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground. And righteousness the Lord will give what is good. Righteousness will go before him. This passage from Ephesians will be the subject of consideration in just a bit. In a few verses is packed a fair summary of the critical components of Pauline theology. A reading from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished upon us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promise of Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. There is only one word for our gospel reading this morning from Mark, and that is grim. It covers the dark side of human life, Herod's adultery with his brother's wife, and the imprisonment and execution of John the Baptist. John's story, like that of Jesus, is not all good. John dies a violent death, the direct consequence of the way he lived, and a ruler who has the power to save is moved more by guilt, self-interest, and pride than by justice and truth. A reading from Mark, chapter 6, verses 14 through 29. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet like the, one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, 
whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and she said to her mother, what should I ask for? And she replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. And then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in the tomb. And this is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, you are our rock and our salvation. Amen. There are certainly lectionary readings from time to time which force one to labor mightily to pull out its message, its guidance, its challenge. These verses from Ephesians, however, which Paul had just read, stand at the other end of the spectrum. While I read it, readily confess to periodically being given to hyperbole, I would offer that this passage contains each and all of the fundamental precepts essential to those of us who call ourselves Christian. Let me begin with just a word about the history and authorship of Ephesians. There are some old manuscripts which do not include the words in Ephesus in the opening salutation of this book, so it may well have been a general letter circulated to several churches at that time. A second question has to do with authorship. Without spending an inordinate amount of time on this, those who are much better schooled than I point out the language and linguistic structure. Note, by way of example, that if you read them in the original Greek, they are basically, that was basically one run-on sentence which would have made even William Faulkner happy, but were not common in the books directly attributable to Paul. The most important thing is that the content is absolutely Pauline, a wonderful summary of Paul's theology about the universal significance of the Christian faith. As we begin to unpack what this holds for us, we need to remember what is most critical for Paul. The foundational backdrop for his faith is the resurrection, Christ's resurrection, our resurrection. We will say more about this in a bit. This passage is fundamentally about the blessings that come to us from God. Here again the list, every spiritual blessing, adoption as his children, glorious grace freely bestowed, redemption, forgiveness of our trespasses, knowing the mystery of his will, a promised inheritance, having the capacity to live for the praise of his glory. Blessings, each and all, blessings which are beyond counting, beyond deserving, certainly beyond comprehending. And these blessings are poured out on all, all. No distinction between Jew and Greek in that day, between Congregationalist and Buddhist in this day. And here's the most important aspect of these blessings. They are part of what has been called God's provenient grace. From Paul's perspective, the gospel is not at the outset about human beings, but about God and what God has done in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. John Calvin describes Ephesians' first three chapters as chiefly occupied in commending the grace of God, he goes on to say, for immediately after the greeting at the beginning of the first chapter, Paul treats of God's free election 
so that they may acknowledge that they are now called into the kingdom of God because they have been appointed to life before they were born. This grace, these abundant blessings are lavished upon us not as some capricious whim of the Almighty, but purposefully planned before the foundation of the world. God has adopted us as God's own children, made us to be God's own people. What is important about the blessings is that they were ours at God's initiative. They were not given in response to who we are or what we have done. They are part of a preordained plan, God's preordained plan. The second point Paul makes is God's appointment of Christ as the agent of our salvation and blessing. Read these passages. Blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Adoption as his children through Jesus Christ. Divine grace through Christ. Redemption that is forgiveness of our sins through Christ. The knowledge of God's purposes in Christ. The unity of all creation in Christ living for the praise of God's glory through Christ. Each and all of these things are ours through Christ. But again, it was God's initiative that caused all this. And Paul then closes out the Trinity in verse 13 with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. So, in a brief summary, blessings poured out on all of us and a plan initiated by God before the beginning of time blessings made possible through Christ's death and resurrection and nurtured in this life by the seal of the Holy Spirit. To this point, we may not have much of a theological challenge. So we come to the question, what is this process in these verses called election? Is this that predestination thing where some of us will make it and some of us won't? It is fair to say that for theologians like Augustine, Luther, Calvin, Edwards, Bart, Ephesians makes clear that election is a statement about the wonder of God's grace. It only becomes misunderstood if it becomes a question about the scope of God's grace. That is, who's included and who's not? And how do I know in which category I reside? Election has to be, above all else, an affirmation that the God Christians, you and I, know in Jesus Christ is gracious beyond our wildest imaginations. Election is important because it says something about who God is and about who those people are, who we are, who have freely and undeservedly received God's grace in Jesus Christ. In addition, election is about the sovereignty of God's will. Repeatedly, we hear that God's choosing is rooted in the good pleasure and mystery of God's counsel and will. It does not mean that God knows which people respond to his grace in Jesus Christ and which don't. Election is good news because it affirms that those who are in Christ belong to God not because they are less sinful than other people or because they have done the right things, but for no other reason than God has chosen to be merciful to them. God's grace is not a response to what human beings have done, but rather that grace which precedes faith and is its source. Again, God's election is always in Christ, and Christ is the mirror in which Christians you and I should contemplate our election. According to both Calvin and Bart, those who wonder if they are included in God's election should look not within themselves, but upon Christ. If we look first at ourselves and what we find in our own hearts and souls, we cannot help but be discouraged. If, however, we looked not at ourselves, but at Christ, And if we see in Christ the grace and mercy promised by God, then we will find assurance that we are included in these promises. Again, election reminds us that we are adopted children of God. 
Those chosen by God in Christ belong to God not because of blood or family, rather that God, as it says in verse 5, destined us for adoption. Our inheritance is utterly gratuitous. This election is not a right, but a gift. All of us who have been justified by God's grace, according to the Westminster Catholic Confession of Faith, are partakers of the grace of adoption. Finally, God's election does not make us special in relation to other people, but rather calls us to specific tasks of serving both God and our neighbor. Any who are elect in Christ are called not to privilege, but to discipleship and the suffering of the cross, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer said. So to my mind, as I consider election and I think about the gracious goodness of the triune God whom we worship, I land squarely on verse 10. God's plan that in the fullness of time, God will gather up all things, all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Not some things, all things. Not some of us, but all of us. And in response, we are to work to the praise and of his glory. But you say, I hear and understand and sing about the God of grace and glory, God who before time bestowed blessings uncountable on us. And then I pick up a newspaper and look at the terrible things that are going on in the world, war and poverty and sickness and suffering and hate. I speak, speak to a neighbor who is facing serious financial hardship. I talk to my nephew who is facing a life of disability. How? How, pray tell, do I square all of this with a gracious God who loves us? Do you remember that song made famous by Peggy Lee, Is That All There Is? While not one of my favorite songs, it is the question we face. So now let us look and go back to the underpinning of Paul's theology, the resurrection life. Resurrection, a life in the community of saints which lies beyond our dying. A difficult concept at first, to be sure. But for Paul, it was absolutely essential and made sense of all that he stood up for and for all that he endured and he knew. He knew that there was something something better that lay beyond this life. And without that concept being ours, it is nigh on impossible to make sense of a God of boundless love with some of what we see and experience. Yes, you might say, but God spoke directly to Paul. Look at what happened to him on the road to Damascus. Whether it was an encounter with Christ or simply a blinding light, anyone would believe. No. While Paul experienced a radical revision of his religious ideas on that road, those improved ideas were not enough. To test their validity, he hurled himself into the living of a Christian life with all the force of his being. And as a consequence, he found a life of intimate friendship with God. God knows all of us his children as one, but he also knows and loves and blesses each one of us individually. And he speaks to us no less directly than he spoke to Paul. God reaches out to us each and every day, every single day. The challenge is that we have to be listening for his voice, looking for his hand, always, everywhere, in the words of a neighbor or a friend, in the act of unselfish kindness at the hands of a stranger, in the accident of fate which affects our life, in the majesty of an ocean view, in the face of a newborn child, in the whisper of an unspoken prayer. And as we look and listen, we develop our own personal relationship with God, a process that goes on throughout our lives. And we, like Paul, 
grow stronger in the assurance of God's grace. And we, like Paul, shift from not only feeling blessed, but living our lives as a blessing to those around us. How do we know? What allows us to be certain that all of this is true? All of this is made possible by the blessing promised in verse 13, the everlasting presence of the Holy Spirit, which itself represents a down payment on the ultimate inheritance of unity and peace. Where the church praises God and confesses Christ as Lord, where the individual, you and I, praise God and confess Christ as Lord, that Holy Spirit is present, assuring us that the divine goal will, in fact, one day become reality. Let all things now living, a song of thanksgiving, to God their creator, triumphantly raise. Amen. Please rise as you are able and join in the singing of hymn number 400, Christ is made the sure foundation. Be seated. When we fear that our resources are inadequate to the needs around us, we are called to trust God's provision. We have enough. We are enough. In confident hope, let us share of our abundance as we receive this morning's offering.
expectation. Who is like you, O Lord our God? You love us with mercy upon the earth. You live with us. As we join together in corporate prayer, are there joys or concerns any would like to raise this morning? Then let us pray. God of blessing, you fling the stars into the heavens and show us more blessings than we can count. You give us treasure that cannot be destroyed. You promise us a feast and peace without end and you hear our prayers. We pray for your world, wounded and scarred. Heal Earth's body and lead us to care. We pray for your church, divided and angry. Unite us in mission and grow us in love. We pray for the lost, the forgotten, the lonely, Gather them in and show us how to love. We pray for the addicted. Save them and strengthen them. We pray for those who have no hope. Give them faith in you. We pray for the greedy. Make them generous. We pray for the poor, sustain them and give them hope. We pray for all those whose burdens we carry in our hearts and offer them up to you. Heal them, comfort them, guide them, and make them whole. Now increase our faith and amplify our hope that by the power of your spirit we might serve you well and be ready to greet you when Christ comes in glory. All this we offer and ask in the name of him who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Amen. As we join to sing in our closing hymn, I remind you that afterwards all are in after we hear a glorious postlude, all are invited downstairs for some food and fellowship. Please stand as you are able and join in singing Blessed Assurance number 473 in the Black Hymn.
notice what is beautiful and what is amiss, counter injustice and guard what is good, rest and work, mindful of God's desire for your health and faith. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. And may the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. This day and forever. Amen.